Let's head to uh, the London Parliament now, where we understand that uh, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is currently addressing the Parliament. Let's listen in. To dissuade Russia from further actions and indeed to push Russia out of Donetsk and Luhansk has clearly got a window of opportunity before the winter starts to bite and the coalition starts to fracture as energy prices in Europe rise and homes across our country start to suffer. Are you able to concentrate on building that alliance at the moment? Uh, yes, and uh, thanks, Tom. The, if you look at what the UK has done over the last uh, couple of weeks, I think that the uh, efforts of, of UK diplomacy, uh, UK um, strategists, uh, security armed forces have been very considerable. And the uh, G7 outcomes were at the upper end of expectations. NATO uh, certainly, again, probably both exceeded expectations in the um, the level of, of unity and uh, virtually every country around the table in NATO uh, determined to uh, help President Zelensky in, in that window of opportunity that you described. And you're seeing, of course, food prices rise around the world as the ports of Odessa are closed, Mariupol and so on, uh, occupied. What are you doing to make sure that the food is getting out from the Black Sea, that the, such wheat as is available is able to get out? How are you supporting the United Nations? And what are you doing to prepare those states, including the Middle East and, of course, in Africa, who are facing enormous food poverty and the possibility of migration and the pressures that that will cause? So, the, first of all, on the, uh, the, the grain that's being held hostage in Odessa, uh, we're working with the with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, uh, who's, who's leading the negotiations. The Turks are clearly crucial. Uh, they, they hold the, the waters. Uh, what the UK is offering is uh, both demining capabilities, uh, including uh, remote demining capabilities, which we're, we're good at, uh, and the insurance of the vessels that might be used to ferry the, the grain out down uh, out from the out through the Bosphorus. Uh, we're also uh, because we're looking at other routes in addition to uh, convoys through the Bosphorus. Uh, we're also doing what we can to uh, help smaller uh, packets of, uh, of grain uh, go through land routes or, or indeed up the, up the river, up the Danube, uh, and out that way. And uh, we're, we're spending some money on upgrading the, the railways to, uh, to that end. And you're starting to see some, some growing quantities of grain coming out, uh, not via the, the Black Sea, but by uh, but over land and, uh, and on the rivers. Now we're seeing, as you know, we're seeing enormous pressure on uh, the weaponry that goes into Ukraine. We're seeing a lot of promises and sadly from many countries fewer deliveries than are promised. What are you doing to increase the production and cooperation between uh, armaments companies around Europe and around the United States and Canada to increase the supply? The, the UK led the way in uh, inaugurating the Ramstein uh, conferences which have brought countries together to supply a weaponry to to Ukraine and uh, and uh, though the Americans and I are very much in the, in the lead on that and are certainly providing uh, the, the, the the bulk of, of what's going in uh, and we'll be doing more in August as the Copenhagen conference as I'm sure you uh, know another another military uh, donor conference the, there is a you know, the, the supplies continue to uh, to go in the Ukrainians are steadily getting the kind of kit that they uh, that they need uh, if they're going to repel the expel the Russians from where where they are. But it's also very important that they are trained to use uh, the uh, the MLRS, the multi multi launch rocket systems, uh, effectively, so that uh, you know very expensive <coughs> weaponry is uh, is put to good use. Now, you've ex your foreign secretary, forgive me, has explained that. Uh, victory in Ukraine means taking back every single square inch of Ukrainian soil, including Crimea. What's your view of victory? Uh, we can't be more Ukrainian than the Ukrainians. Uh, that's for, for them to decide. That President Zelensky has set out his, uh, his ambitions. Uh, it will ultimately be for him to decide what uh, the terms that, that he wants. But he's been very clear that he would like to return at least to the status quo ante uh, February the 24th. And so what, do you, what is your view of what victory for us should look like? I think that uh, that's, uh, I think the victory for, uh, for the Ukrainians would be a, a result that uh, the Ukrainian people uh, feel uh, is the right one. And at the moment, I think I'm right in saying that 
90% or more of, of Ukrainians uh, believe passionately that there should be no deal that involves land for peace, and they want uh, the Russians expelled uh, from every part of the territory uh, that Putin is invading. Are you confident of holding the NATO agreement together, in the, or rather the European and American agreement together, in making sure that that coalition sustains the Ukrainians even when the winter prices start to bite? I think what was notable at, uh, at Madrid was how uh, anxieties about the friability of the uh, coalition uh, were proved to be unfounded, and that's because the logic of the situation simply demands international unity. There's, there's no other solution, there's no deal on, on offer. Uh, even if uh, the Ukrainians wanted to do a deal of, uh, of land for peace, uh, Putin isn't offering uh, any such deal. He still re remains utterly maximalist in his <coughs> objectives, and that's why uh, we have to continue to support Zelensky in the way that we are, and, and that's accepted around the table. And part of your commitment to sustaining uh, Ukrainian operations and indeed wider British military operations is your increase to 2.5%, given that the various international organisations and indeed our own statistical agencies do not foresee any growth in the UK economy in the coming years. Who are you going to take the money off in order to increase the defence budget? Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm not certain I agree with your, your, your premise about the, uh, the, the growth of the UK economy in the, in the coming years. I think if you look at the both, I'm sure we'll come to this in, the, in, uh, in, in later sections, but in both the I, uh, IMF and the OECD see us uh, going back to uh, at or near the top of the uh, of the growth league. It's still I a think, percentage I th rather I than think, an absolute. Yeah, sure. Uh, but uh, the, um, the, the, um, uh, the 2.5 is a logical, it's, it's just a prediction. It's, it's based on uh, the, I think, reasonable assumption that we are going to con have to continue with the investments that we're making in the future combat aircraft system and the, and the AUKUS uh, agreements with the Australians and the, and the Americans. These are very, these are very big projects, and uh, they'll 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 be expensive, but they're the right things for the country. And so, the last question from me will be on Sweden and Finland. Clearly, their membership of NATO is an extremely important event, not just for them, but for all of us. Uh, what are the implications for the guarding of the High North, and particularly the uh, integrity of the United Kingdom and Scotland as part of that uh, in uh, the alliance? And what are the commitments that the UK is willing to make? to uh, increase cooperation with Sweden and Finland, not just in military supplies, but also in training. Yeah, well, we, thank you. We already do a lot of uh, cooperating with the, the Joint Expeditionary uh, Force. The JEF, as, as you know, uh, is up there in the, in the high north. Uh, the, the addition of, of Finland and, and Sweden is a great moment for uh, the alliance. I think it will, it will strengthen uh, the alliance, and you know, it tells you all you need to know about uh, Putin. Uh, and his aggression at countries as peaceable as uh, Sw Sweden and Finland have decided to join NATO. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Prime Minister, good to see you uh, again. We're establishing that the world is getting more dangerous. The next decade is going to be very bumpy indeed. I want to focus on UK defence capabilities. Despite the injection of £24 billion, pounds, the integrated view has seen a tilt towards cyber and space, which is welcome, but it's come at the expense of cuts to all three conventional services. At your last appearance here, prior to the Russian invasion, you boldly stated that tanks are not the answer to the defense of Ukraine, that the old concept, concepts of tank battles on the European landmass are over. Prime Minister, do you now recognize the value of tanks as part of our land for warfare mix? And plans to reduce our tank numbers now need to be reviewed? Uh, I th thank you very much, Tobias. I think that. Uh, when you, when, when you certainly, I think that it's important for the UK uh, to have uh, tanks, but uh, I think for the Ukrainian purposes, uh, even more valuable were anti-tank weapons. And if you look at what really changed the uh, course of the first few weeks of the war, it was the javelins, it was the Endors uh, in particular, and the javelins uh, that were used to destroy the tanks and ready to uh, make, uh, make Russia's tank warfare extremely difficult, and you, you'll have seen exactly what happened. That's understood, and I don't disagree with that. What I'm trying to stress at is that the defence budget it will actually go down by a billion pounds in 2023-24, according to library figures. And you mentioned end laws. We have stockpiles which are being depleted. We're short of deep fire capabilities, uh, rocket artillery, air defence, and indeed hypersonics as well. This is where the character of conflict is moving. 
We need to invest more, including in those tanks, which we're cutting by a third, and indeed our warrior fighting vehicles. We have no capability to do dismounted infantry because we're actually cutting the entire warrior fleet. Could I beg with the Prime Minister to reconsider the army numbers? If there's one thing he could take away from here, with his new Chancellor, to look at securing £40 million required to reverse the cuts uh, in our army manpower. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, just, I just want to stress that the, uh, you know, we, we value uh, immensely the, the, the armed forces in the sense we value the, the numbers of, of troops. Uh, if you include the reserves, they're, they're in fact over 100,000, uh, so 73,000 in the regular army plus 30,000 uh, reserves. Uh, but I, I think it's also very important that, and I, you know, I heard uh, all the, the points that people like General Sanders have, have, have made, uh, but the important thing is uh, 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 to have the best possible equipment uh, for those, uh, those, those troops, and, and that's what we're doing. Well, let's look at that equipment, because in the Army, I just said, we're losing a third of our tanks, we're losing our warrior fighting vehicles, uh, we're decimating our tracked land warfare capability. In the RAF, we're down from 36 squadrons during the Gulf War to just six today. We're losing all our Hercules heavy lift, we're losing, um, uh, we only have 48 of the uh, 138 F-35s, we're losing uh, two of the E-7 I-Star aircraft that are so critical to work with the F-35s. And in the Navy, in 1990s, during the Cold War, we had 13 destroyers, 35 frigates, and now we're down to just 18. We are hollowing out all our armed services at the very time that, as you mentioned, the head of the army is saying we face in 1937 moment. This is to the time to be investing in our armed forces, uh, not uh, depleting our yeah. capability. Well, I agree with that, but that's why we're spending uh, 24 billion uh, over the next uh, four years, it's the biggest increase since the end of the uh, of the Cold War, and I think that money is being is being wisely spent. You, uh, you, you, uh, it's you been talk spent about already. It's gone. It, you, well, it's over. It's over the, the, the next four years. Yeah, it's gone into invest into paying for the replacement of the Vanguard submarines. It, the, the money didn't even hit the sides. That's where it was needed to make sure that program allowed us to continue our nuclear deterrent. I, I, I understand, but you know we're we're, we're also committed, as I as I said earlier on, to uh, a number of uh, massive projects. You mentioned heavy lift aircraft. Actually, if you uh, if you look at what the UK has, it's uh, I think we're still by far the biggest uh, possessor of, uh, of heavy lift aircraft in uh, in Europe. Um, uh, on on ships, uh, where we've got a, a very active uh, shipbuilding. Program, you know, Tobias. I take your point about tanks again, humbly and, and, and sincerely. And you know, I, I, I will, I will take it away and look at it and look at, it, look at the armoured uh, personnel carriers, the armoured vehicles. Uh, they have been useful uh, to the Ukrainians, uh, particularly the armoured, uh, the armoured vehicles. Uh, but uh, you know, the committee should be in no doubt. We're, we're investing massively in defence. I, I, I hear what you say, but I mean, you're a, you're a classicist. You know, your responses to date make me feel like. Um, Homer's Cassandra. I, I, I say to you, we must prepare for the storm clouds that are coming over the horizon, and you don't seem to believe me. I say right. we can't afford these troop cuts uh, in, our, in our army numbers, but you don't believe me. And I say that we need to reverse these cuts in our land warfare systems, our ships, and indeed our planes, and you still no, don't I, believe me. I, I do and there that. is a change afoot. We are our history and the turning point in our history, and we need to prepare for what is coming over the horizon. Britain must play its part. There is a gap in leadership in Europe, and I want Britain to assume that role. We can only do so if we prepare today and I, advance I, I our defence really posture. I really think you should have been at NATO to listen well, to I wasn't invited, what the, well, uh, one, 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 one day, one day, one day, uh, uh, to listen to what the other countries say about the UK contribution and the uh, indispensability of uh, UK armed forces. Our contribution to uh, to NATO's new force model, uh, the role that we uh, we play, we're the second biggest spender uh, in NATO, but a massive contributor to uh, all the joint operations. And uh, I think Jens Stoltenberg, uh, the Secretary General, uh, would uh, would testify that. And, and when you say I, I don't you know, believe, that's not true. I do understand the need for uh, more spending on. It has to be balanced against That's other it. priorities, and it is going up. Then reverse those troop numbers. Okay. Um, can I just press one matter related to this? We have given away our training stocks of NLAW, of um, MLRS, and other munitions to the Ukrainians. 
what are we doing to galvanise the supply chain back to a wartime capability that will provide resilience of stocks? Because at the moment, we simply can't replace those stocks. Well, thank you. Uh, but actually, if you look at what's happening in, in Belfast, they, they, are, they are making a lot of emeralds. Uh, uh, they're not replacing as fast as we're giving them away. That is a fact. That um, is true. They, they take a while to make, but we're, we're replacing them. But I mean, this goes to the heart of the integrated review, which was very good on analysis and uh, requirement, but very, there are only two pages on the implementation. Um, what are we going to do to make sure that we implement the defence integrated review so that we actually have the capability ready when we need it? Because well, at the moment we don't. Well, we're supplying a huge amount of capability. Uh, I, you know, I accept the, uh, the view that we need to, to modernise and, and do more, and uh, more end laws are, uh, are certainly rolling off the production line at Tarles, I think it's Tarles in in Belfast. Is it time to quickly? Uh, is it time to uh, review aspects of the integrated review? I think the integrated review has st uh, stood the test of time well. And, We're going to move on. Uh, and you know, I'm happy to take it up, mate. Um, um, Angus McNeil. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, Prime Minister, about four years ago just now, I was comparing your predecessor to Gloria Gaynor, uh, because she will survive. At that very moment, there was uh, perhaps a young Loch Edvar type making his resignation statement in the House of Commons at that moment. Can you remember who that was? Um, uh, Mr. McNeil, I, I, you have to... You, 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 it was yourself, you Prime Minister. I was okay. just checking that you, okay. you, you're a bit of a trendsetter in yes, that yes, regard. Yes, yes, um, yes. But... What, it seems from the rumours I'm hearing from Conservative MPs that you're beyond Gloria Gaynor, you're more the Paul Young and you want to tear the playhouse down. And the warning they're getting is, if it's a sure destruction of the Prime Minister, you might make it mutual. Uh, you might call a general election of a cull of Tory MPs something, of course, that would be very welcome in, in many sides. Uh, but the point of clarification and disagreement that some of us have had in light of powers being taken away from the Fixed Term Parliament Act do you need the permission of the Queen, or do you just need to inform the Queen to hold an election? No, I, I, I really uh, don't think that uh, anybody in this country wants politicians to be engaged in uh, electioneering uh, now can, or, can in, the, you answer or, the or in the, or in the permission? future. And I think that we need to get on with serving, the, uh, serving our, our voters and uh, dealing with the issues that they care about. So you're nearly backbenchers at that. Okay. Um, interestingly, we've had some difficulty in the Nas International Trade Committee with CRAG and the triggering of the uh, process uh, to bring about uh, this, and you're going to note about this, um, in Parliament. We look for an extension of CRAG. But I also want to put it to you, Prime Minister, you know, Brexit is a 5% damage to GDP. And these trade agreements you're signing up to are a minor part. I mean, the point zero... Well, that was the embattled UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson at the House of Commons, who is facing tough questions by senior members of Parliament of the Liaison Committee about his leadership credentials, including his view and actions in the ongoing war in Ukraine. Johnson is adamant that he will stick to his role as the Premier of the United Kingdom, despite a string of ministers resigning en masse following a spate of scandals that are facing the Prime Minister. Johnson was earlier grilled by members of Parliament, including Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer. And meanwhile, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has appointed his Chief of Staff, Steve Barclay, as the next Health Minister, while businessman and current Education Minister Nadim Zahawi was named as the new Finance Minister. This comes after former Health Minister Sajid Javid and former Finance Minister Rishi Sunak resigned. We On is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.